Hello, everyone. My name is Isidre Sala. I'm the head of the delegation of the Catalan government to the US, and it's a great pleasure to welcome all of you in this online event about the recent trip of President Biden to Europe. This online event has been organized in partnership between two delegations of the Catalan government, the delegation uh, to the US and the delegation to the European Union, as well as the Center for Contemporary Studies, an in-house think tank of the government of Catalonia that follows the main contemporary challenges and debates. We are celebrating this event because this trip has been very important. It has been the first abroad trip of President of Joe Biden as President of the United States, and probably it's not by, ch by chance that the destination chosen was Europe. The reconstruction of a strong transatlantic partnership to face today's global challenges has been among top Biden promises, both as a candidate and now as a president. Catalans have always been committed with the European project, and therefore the perspective that this trip could pave the way for a new era of stronger transatlantic cooperation is most welcome from Catalonia. To analyze the expectations of the President Biden trip, we have the pleasure to come with a transatlantic panel of experts today. From DC, we will have experts from the American University and the Institute for Women's Policy Research, from Barcelona, an American panelist from Institute International, Institute Barcelona Studies Internationals, and last but not least, from Brussels, European capital, an expert from the European Policy Center. So let's start with today's debate. We have the pleasure to welcome here today Dr. Michelle Egan from the School of International Service at American University from speaking from Washington, DC. Dr. Federica Bindi, Director of the Policy, the Director of the Foreign Policy Initiative at the Institute for Women's Policy Research from DC2. Jeffrey Michaels, Senior Fellow in, in, in American Foreign Policy at the Institute Barcelona Studies Internationals from Barcelona. And Ricardo Borges de Castro, Associate Director at the European Policy Center from Brussels. Thanks to all of you for having accepted our invitation. And let's break the ice with Dr. Egan. Dr. Egan, how do you summarize the highlights of President Biden's trip to Europe from an American perspective? I would summarize it as um, very much the tone was different from the previous administration. And so he achieved his goal of America is back. I would also say that they had a very diverse and ambitious agenda, some of which was achieved in terms of coordination with allies. But I would also say that um, it will take quite some time to rebuild some of the trust given the sort of unilateralism of the last four years. And I think it was not unusual. I think it was very important, the sequencing of the summits. You start with the UK, a big ally, the host. You go to the US-EU summit and NATO, so you can meet Putin with the allies behind you. So I, I would be there because I think it was the tone and the narrative were really the most important optics from a a European perspective. Yeah, so if you want to add some remarks about uh, what do you think about um, whether it was a success, we can define it as a success, or what do you think was something missing? Um, I think it was a success in the sense that there were agreement on certain issues. If you look at some of the communiques, there's an awful lot, for example, in the NATO communique on Russia but a lot less on China. And I think they'll have to be, I think the goal now is because sort of in areas of trade in particular, both the US and EU are focusing on economic recovery and both of them are focusing on the geostrategic nature of trade. They will have to come together, you know, which is something the US administration would like vis-a-vis -vis China. We can see that there is a convergence on uh, Russia, cybersecurity, electoral, electoral interference, but vis-a-vis -vis China on trade, you know, there is a convergence. And I think that's, you know, the Trade and Technology Council that was announced will move us in that direction. But, you know, a lot of these are still deliverables. So it's one thing to sort of say, we have a corporate tax agreement, minimum corporate tax. We want to do more on cybersecurity. The bigger issue is they've left an agenda to be fulfilled. 
So I would say glass half full because I'm uh, that way inclined. Okay, it's never it's never the job fully done, of course. Um, wonderful. Uh, is there anything else you you like to remark or highlight about? Uh, because there were so many different events and so many different summits. Uh, something special you believe that was the highlight of the trip? The highlight of the trip would probably be, you know, almost got off to a rocky start. I mean, one has to think about how Britain was caught on the back foot at the, you know, it almost overshadowed the summit because the issue of Northern Ireland, the UK withdrawal from the EU and the Northern Ireland Protocol. To some degree, my fear initially when all that was making news is that would overshadow some of the broader issues they needed to discuss. And so to me, that was a problem in terms of diplomatic planning from the UK side to be so backfooted with a domestic issue when you're hosting such a high profile G7 summit. So that was the first thing I would say. The tone and narrative were my takeaways in terms of allies, build back better, all the narratives of Joe Biden. And I would say that the third issue that is not a success, despite the newspapers, would be on trade. You know, it was one thing to say we have sort of solved the Airbus Boeing dispute. We've just kicked the can down the road. But, you know, the other issue is still the tariffs imposed by Trump are still here. The WTO still needs reform. And, um, you know, they're still kind of, they're not on the same page on all trade and regulatory issues. So that's to me where more work could and should be done, digital and trade and regulation. Sure. And do you think there is a different perspective from both sides of the Atlantic, whether it has been the goals achieved or not? I would say that um, from the other issue to think about is who is your target audience? And from a U.S. perspective, you know, they didn't set high expectations. They were sort of using a lot of you know, this is a foreign policy for the working class, build back better, economic recovery, that's all very nice. Um, but there was also a domestic audience. Um, one should probably place this in the context is that, you know, in terms of foreign policy, there's a lot of bipartisan agreement on NATO. And we should not forget that this is not just about the president going overseas, but he also has to deal with a very, you um, fragmented Congress. And so he's sort of, you know, the needle that he's trying to, uh, to thread, you know, there's support from Republicans on what he's doing vis-a-vis -vis NATO and Russia and sanctions. But on the other hand, he has to also be cognizant of the progressives in, in Congress, the Democrats who want to talk about climate and more progressive social issues. So it's not just a foreign policy and how it's perceived by Europeans. It's also a foreign policy, how it's perceived by the, you know, both sides of Congress as well. Great, thanks, thanks so much. Uh, feel free to, to come back later to, to other you. Uh, aspects if you, if you wish so. So now we, um, we would like to, to introduce the next, uh, next panelist today. Um, the next panelist it is uh, Dr. Federica Vindi. She is director of the Foreign Policy Initiative at the Institute of, for Women's Policy Research. She's speaking from, from DC2. And um, you may probably uh, complement this vision of the, the strip uh, from, from the American perspective, uh, maybe emphasizing more on the on soft social aspects. So, Ms. Bindi, thanks for being here with us today. Uh, the floor is yours. So, I, yeah, no, certainly, I, I agree with what Michelle has said. I have to say, I have two opposite visions my American self and my European self. So, if you look at it as, as my American self, it was mission accomplished. I mean, uh, it was very well chore choreographed. Uh, it showed that uh, Joe Biden is someone who has a long standing and deep experience, uh, especially meeting with Russia. It's something that uh, 
few would have had the, the, the guts to do it. And because the, at the domestic arena was very divided about it and he handled superbly. So he did, he got more or less European board on China. So it was as good as it gets. Um, if you look at from the, my European self perspective, I think uh, it's, you know, the, Amer the Europeans were clearly very happy to finally have an American leader telling them what to do. And uh, that is, I have mixed feelings about that, I have to say. I mean, the four years during Donald Trump were horrible, especially in this country, but uh, in a way they also offered an opportunity to the European Union, which was unable to seize. And the European Union could have seized the initiative and, and what we saw during those four years and what came clear during Joe Biden's visit to Europe is that the Europeans are Gregory to the European, to the, to the Americans. They do not, have the will or the strength to, to create real foreign policy on their own without following the Americans. The other thing that uh, I think came out is that, uh, you know, the Europeans are divided on China. They still don't understand. They still have to straighten their priorities. I mean, Joe Biden, and here is a big change, not only from Trump, but also from Obama, clearly understand that the challenge comes from China, the future challenge, the current challenge, and this is in all domains, economically, trades, defense, and, and the European as usual are behind, you know, they, they, in a way, but this you also see domestically. Here, Joe Biden is seizing the opportunity of COVID to bring enormous change to the country, enormous, you know, infrastructure, everything. And, and, and uh, you, you can physically feel that the country is relaunching and changing and, and you don't get the same feeling from Europe. So it's said, mix uh, glass, as Michelle said. Sure, sure. Well, wonderful, wonderful to, to have with you, uh, to, to, that, that you have this double vision from, from, from both perspectives. Um, can you imagine this trip without the pandemic? Do you think it has been, uh, could have been completely different? So pandemic was always on the table, no? Well, you know, uh, we'll see what, what comes out on the investigation on China, what was the role of, the role of China in this pandemic. But uh, if delaying the information was a way to weaken or destroy the US, the pandemic clearly had the opposite effect. First of all, for as much as I love President Biden, I'm not 100% convinced that he would have won without the pandemic. The pandemic clearly wiped Trump out. And, and secondly, as said, he has very progressive, very progressive agenda domestically and things which would have been unimaginable a few months ago, which is pushing through, you know, as I said, infrastructure, education, healthcare, using the excuse of COVID. So overall, COVID, it's giving life to a systemic change in the US, which is projecting the US into the next century. And, and this is clearly not happening in Europe. So Europe is falling behind and behind while the US are progressing. Sure, and do you think that uh, this America is, uh, America, sorry, by American program of uh, President Biden could somehow damage these new relations where they are trying to build in the area of trade and, and commerce? We saw last week that they also agreed to to withhold this kind of um, um, uh, tariff, um, but of course there's not no, there's no permanent agreement yet. So it's something that also has to be uh, dealt. So what do you think could be the expectations? No, I don't, I don't think this is going to have a, a major impact. I mean, we also it's also a practical policy. I mean, at the moment there is a problem in shipping things overseas. I'll give you one, one example. I have a Vespa here in DC. I have a problem with my brake and we brought it to the shop in October, which is seven months ago. And in seven months, we still haven't received the little piece that is needed to fix my Vespa, right? So, you know, we wanted to buy a new car with my husband and there was a nice Audi for sale and the love Audi. 
And my husband was like, you know, if something happens, the car is going to be down for months, right? So it's uh, it's more practical things that that needs to be sold. I, I don't think the policy by itself will will be a damage. I mean, I think gradually things will go back to where they were. Also because Europeans like to buy Americans, Americans like to buy European. So sure, but also the pandemic can can affect somehow uh, the different governments and can. Um... Uh, somehow tempt them to 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 be more protectionist, no, in order to overcome uh, um, the, the the economic crisis and to to create more jobs. Do you think that this could uh, somehow could be an obstacle for this uh, new relationship? Uh, As I said, I think things will be slowly going back to normal. It's it's really it's really a problem of the production line at the moment. So protectionism also actually helps putting things back on their feet you know if you i mean if you don't have my piece of break you can't ship it overseas you see what i mean so i i think we'll be slowly going back as production will will take full stream as you know as uh, as uh, shipping things overseas will retake their full stream and uh, i mean Trade has always been a, a major area of cooperation, but also rivalry between the EU and the US. But I, in that area, I tend to see more cooperation coming forward rather than rivalry. And we have seen the beginning of it on the Boeing air, uh, affair, right? Your bus affair. Yeah, exactly. And since you are more in the social uh, area, um, what do you think we can expect about this uh, intention of Biden that was already promised before the election of holding a global summit for democracy? Uh, we still have little details, but it's something that is coming, but we still don't know exactly when and, and what is going to tackle. Uh, do you think that Europe can play a role in this? You know, uh, th this again is an area where we can see that Biden has decades of experience. And I think it's, as a political scientist more than anything else, I think it's very clear that the quality of democracy is deteriorating everywhere. You know, I was having a discussion with a friend about my home country, Italy, where we all love Draghi and we all love Draghi because he is doing whatever he wants, not listening to the political parties. And that is of course helping efficiency, but in democratic terms, is really not good because our democracy is a parliamentary democracy and parties are designed by constitution to have a relevant role. And I gave this example, but you know, look at Hungary, you know, there, there, there are signs everywhere that democracy was eroding. And that was also the case in the US during the Trump, uh, the Trump administration, right? So it's, it's a very to important topic. And one of the things I like about President Biden is that he's someone who really believes in values, right? And, and he understands clearly that the strength of the West has been the value, right? And especially as a European living in, having lived in America for a long time, I always found that people underestimate the uh, moral effect of the US, the fact that people looked at the US as an example rather than more than anything else, right? And, uh, and he understand that he understand that if the Western world doesn't restore its democratic system, and you know we could start talking about Spain <laughs> from many points of view, and uh, uh, you know and the recent events, and uh, it's it will be a problem because we are not able to talk values with the others unless values at home are restored, and this is also if you think what what Putin picked on, right? When he was asked during the press conference, he said, look, you know, <laughs> what happens in the US? And, you know, he has a point. Although things have incredibly improved. I mean, there are so many, so many injustices, and so many rights that are still denied, which, which, is, which is not thinkable in a Western democracy. So what Biden is trying to do is, I think, very important. And I think that the Western world should listen carefully and should uh, act accordingly. Sure, great, great, uh, Ms. Bindi. Thanks very much for all these very interesting insights.
So now what we are going to do is what President Biden did and cross the ocean, uh, fly to the European uh, capital, sorry, to Barcelona first then. Um, and we are going to give the floor to to Mr. Jeffrey, Jeffrey Michaels. Jeffrey Michaels is a senior fellow in American foreign policy at Institute Barcelona Studies Internationals, uh, talking from Barcelona. And uh, you know, you are also American, so you can have also this uh, double perspective on the issue working from Europe now. So maybe you can also uh, send us your perspective on this trip. Sure, well, first of all, thank you very much for the kind invitation to participate in today's uh, event. <clears throat> As the third speaker, I'll, I'll try and do my best not to repeat anything that's been said already by Megan or um, Federico. Uh, I think with a subject like this, we're just offering different perspectives. So uh, here goes with mine, and uh, please stop me if I go on uh, for too long. Um, so so how, how, how to judge a trip like this? I mean, this is the question that you, that you started with. I, mean, I think one way is to compare this trip with other first European trips of American presidents. I mean, if you go back to Obama's trip in 2009, that was hailed as a, as a great success, um, coming as it did after eight years of George W. Bush, the chaos of the Iraq war and so forth. Uh, Trump's first European visit in 2017 was uh, what I would probably describe as a diplomatic farce. Uh, the less said about it, the better. Uh, Biden, Biden's trip wasn't quite the triumph of Obama's, but it wasn't it, it was certainly a far cry from Trump's trip. Now, in terms of what it achieved, I would probably split this into two categories. <clears throat> the first being uh, optics and style. Uh, Biden smiling, shaking hands with other European leaders, happy to see him. Uh, you know, he, he Biden looks and acts like a statesman. Uh, no one was deliberately offended, uh, with a possible exception of the Spanish prime minister. Uh, who managed to get 30 seconds of face time with Biden as they strolled past the barber shop in the entranceway to NATO headquarters. But I mean, overall, it looked positive. Uh, news reports are generally positive with some criticism, especially in Russia, uh, but, but overall positive. I mean, th th this was an easy trip for Biden. I'm sort of reminded of the expression, uh, you know, uh, famous for being famous that used to be attributed to Princess Diana. Uh, you know, this was an automatic success because it wasn't Trump. Uh, you know, this, this was softball. It was Biden's trip to screw up, and he didn't. You know, not that anyone was expecting him to. Uh, I mean, after Trump, it was always going to be easy. Any other U.S. president, or, or at least uh, almost any other president, uh, was going to be an improvement. So, you know, you didn't have American diplomats worried that Biden was going to tweet something offensive or say something offensive. So a very different dynamic, uh, a return to normality. You know, differences between allies still exist, uh, clearly, but the bottom line impression was that Biden is a breath of fresh air, uh, though clearly there's a lot of trepidation about a Trump return or perhaps somebody of Trump's ilk. Uh, the second way, of course, to evaluate a trip like this has to do with substance. What messages, what policies emerged? Um, each of the meetings produced statements, some more meaningful than others, as already been alluded to. Uh, I lost track of the number of times Biden said America is back. I think after this trip, he really needs a new slogan. Um, I think probably the most amusing output, of course, from this trip was the so-called New Atlantic Charter between the US and UK. Uh, this was Biden's chance to play the role of FDR, whom he admires, uh, you know, who looks at every day in the Oval Office. He has his portrait in, in, in the Oval Office. And of course, for Boris Johnson, he loves playing Churchill. So this was good news for him as well. Uh, you know, the, the, the charter didn't really say anything beyond the standard talking points though I think the nuclear reference in it was effectively a subtext related to the recent UK decision to increase the cap on the nuclear warheads, with the US essentially saying it supports the decision without explicitly saying so. Um, regardless, I think Biden seems to be getting along fairly well with Boris, which surprised me somewhat. Uh, I literally didn't think the two would see eye to eye on much. Uh, Biden seems to be putting the British state uh, above the British leader and has continued you know, making these references to the special relationship. But I mean, overall, if you compare the communiques and the statements uh, coming out of Biden's meetings with the G7+, plus, NATO and the EU, you see quite a few similar themes uh, emerge, um, beating the pandemic, climate change, combating authoritarian and autocratic governments, uh, singling out China and Russia, supporting dem democratic governments, dealing with changes in technology and cyber threats and so forth. Actually, on the, on the supports of democracies, I was quite intrigued because um, 
the, the, you know, to go to your point, um, Biden avoided the uh, Alliance of Democracies meeting that uh, occurred last month in Copenhagen, uh, led by the former NATO SecGen, uh, Anders Fogh Rasmussen, which Biden was originally expected to participate in and which Biden had been associated with in previous years. I can only suppose the White House didn't want its own summit later this year to be upstaged, but you know, this goes to show that they're more concerned about image uh, than substance, which I think is unfortunate. Uh, there was quite a lot of mention made about Biden's pushing the China threat. I think uh, Megan mentioned this uh, and, and with, with, with NATO communique uh, and NATO taking this on board. Uh, yes and no, I mean, Biden has been pushing this issue, but you know, it's been on the agenda for some time. Uh, it was actually mentioned in the 2019 London Declaration uh, from that uh, meeting of, uh, of NATO. I mean, essentially, what you have now is a snowball effect. Uh, when you look at the way the NATO summit communique framed the China issue, I mean, it was still pretty weak stuff, even by NATO standards. Uh, but apart from that, you heard a lot of references to Article 5, that it's sacred, how valuable NATO is to the United States. You didn't hear very much about defense spending, which was the big theme under Trump. Uh, two issues that did surprise me, however, were Firstly, his meetings with the heads of the Baltic states and with the Bucharest Nine, uh, essentially reaffirming US support for NATO's uh, Eastern flank as its top priority uh, in NATO. Uh, despite the media interest in NATO and China, uh, you know, it's an issue that's actually quite low in the pecking order. Even the terrorism issue uh, in NATO is, is sort of has a much higher priority. Uh, the second issue was Afghanistan. And in this sense, the key takeaway was an agreement with the Turks to provide security for the, uh, the airport in, in just outside of Kabul. Uh, and I would say this was a major win for the Turks, uh, assuming that this still goes ahead, um, because it gives them a lot of diplomatic leverage. And it surprised me because of the bad relations between Biden and Erdogan, which were not uh, on display in Brussels. Uh, this despite the Biden administration's recent use of the term Armenian genocide. Uh, yet this issue of solidarity with Erdogan, as well as other leaders whose democratic credentials are rather flimsy, uh, if non-existent, um, shows that on the democracy issue, and despite the constant references to value, which was alluded to by Federica, um, you know, that this is somehow central to US foreign policy, uh, it seems to me that they're certainly with, willing to compromise on that front. Uh, all of this will almost certainly sort of, I think what Biden did recently with Erdogan uh, and the others, it'll it'll undermine Biden's agenda, this democracy agenda over the longer term, if it seemed to be quite hollow. Uh, and sort of in a related issue, uh, I think that was notable by its absence was Israel and Gaza. Uh, you, you didn't really see very many references to that at all. Uh, in his talks with the EU, the issue of Iran came up, but given the recent political changes in Tehran that just happened over the last couple of days, uh, those negotiations are likely to take a turn for the worse not that they were proceeding very favorably beforehand. Uh, the Biden administration, I think, made some very bad diplomatic choices in terms of how they decided to proceed with the negotiations, expecting Tehran to make the first concessions, which effectively was sort of stabbing someone with a knife and then twisting it. Uh, and finally, uh, my final point on Biden and Putin and their three hour long meeting. Uh, in my mind, this was a big disappointment, not that expectations were very high, but I was expecting a bit more initiative on the American side. I mean, at least on the nuclear issue, there's been a lot of informal talks underway uh, for months now, trying to come up with different ways of making progress on arms control. Uh, a lot of interesting ideas have been put forward, uh, but instead in Switzerland, all we got was a short statement saying that on the nuclear issue, the two sides agreed to hold further talks, uh, but they did at least reaffirm the Reagan-Gorbachev pledge that a nuclear war can never be fought. Uh, it, must, it can never be won and then therefore must never be fought. Otherwise, it was a meeting of contrasts, smiles and handshakes on the one hand versus uh, mutual recriminations on the other. Uh, the Biden team have repeatedly stated that they have laid down the law uh, using the term red lines, uh, which was not one of uh, Obama's uh, favorite um, uh, terms, uh, certainly not by the end of his administration. Uh, and, and sort of it's always, you know, one, one, one problem with Biden, I think, using the term red line is that he hasn't actually said what that means in, in sort of practical terms. It's basically anybody's guess. And this is, this is a problem, either it's very precise, which is risky because then you're really obligated to do something about it once the other guy's crossed it, or it's essentially in, an invisible line that's easy to cross because no one knows where it is. And I think that's where we are now. And I'll, I'll stop there, thanks. Great, perfect, uh, Jeffrey. Fantastic uh, overview of uh, many different uh, aspects. 
Um, I'm going to, to introduce the next speaker and then we'll come back to, to some of the questions you, you put on the table, uh, so many different uh, aspects and, and to allow all the rest of the speakers to, to come to the debate. So now it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Borges de Castro. Uh, Ricardo Borges de Castro is an associate director at the European Policy Center uh, in Brussels. And um, probably you are the most indicated person here to give us how the, you, how the Brussels uh, perspective on this trip uh, can be explained. So Mr. De, de Castro, welcome and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Isidro. I mean, it's, it's a, I'm delighted to, to, to be here with you today, also with Michelle, Federica, and Jeffrey, also to share my views uh, of, of, I mean, of this, of this week uh, um, uh, in which uh, President uh, Biden spent, uh, um, spent in Europe. I mean, I think in terms of sort of, let's say, a general assessment, and, and particularly then, you know, looking at, at the EU-US uh, summit, I think it was a moment uh, for reset. And in that sense of, 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 of restarting a relationship, uh, as it were, I think it was uh, relatively uh, successful. So I think the president, uh, President uh, Biden, uh, came I mean, to Brussels. But I mean, like, like it was said, it started, uh, you know, with the G7 uh, in the UK, then here uh, in Brussels with uh, with NATO and the EU. The EU in between had a, had a, had a summit with uh, with Canada as well, which is relevant. And also then uh, President uh, Biden went on to 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 to, to Geneva to meet uh, Mr. Putin. So I think all in all, I think it was a good reset. But really, I, I believe that, I mean, the, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. So I think, I mean, on the statements and the things that you see that were, uh, that were announced, uh, that, uh, you know, that were launched, um, I think now, I think the really the, 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 harder, the harder work uh, will have to start. I would say that, uh, that this sets the relationship or, or the reset puts the relationship on a good track. And, but I think also, I mean, if I can look a little bit backwards and then uh, look forward, I, I would say that I mean the the, the worlds and, and the, I mean the world in general and the the transatlantic relationship changed over the past four years, but it was already changing before. I mean, the, the, let's say the the, the the way that the U.S. and the EU have have sort of interacted over the years was already changing a little bit with President uh, with President Obama. We, we pivot to Asia. I mean, I had the, the the privilege as a staffer to President Barroso to be in the White House at the uh, EU U.S. summit uh, in 2011. And we normally sometimes use this expression of the atmospherics. And of course, I mean, the atmospherics were very nice, were very business-like, but it, I mean, it was not sort of as warm as an European, as a transatlanticist, I would have, I would, I would have, I would, would have expected. I think in that respect, President Biden really is the best president that we could have at this, at, at, at this, at this stage of the relationship. Because clearly, as it was said already, he has you know enormous uh, international ex uh, experience. He's known by everyone. He knows everyone. He also has, I mean, uh, even if sometimes he's uh, he's prone to to say to say some things that have gotten him in trouble in the past. He's, I mean, he's a diplomat and he knows how to interact with leaders. And, and so I think that 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 it, it was very important. But I believe that this, you know, the, the, the relationship, and especially then during, of course, the, the, the presidency of, of President Trump, I think the level of distrust and the fact that the U.S., it was coming, I mean, let's say the challenges to the, to, to the transatlantic relationship, the challenge even to the unity of the West were coming from Washington. And that completely changed uh, the calculation. And so for me, what, what this for me means, and I think also from a Europe, seen from a European perspective, is that to a certain extent, even if some of, of the speakers already are, you know, say that, you know, Europe is still is not getting it together, and I share some of those concerns, I think Europeans, at least intellectually, we started a conversation and that there's more of an emancipation on how we should, we should, we should um, uh, you know, participate or be, or, or, or sort of handle the, the transatlantic relationship. So I think um, there's been more sort of an anticipation. There's been a lot of discussion about, about um, you know, uh, autonomy, about sovereignty. I'm not personally necessarily in agreement with some of, with some of, some of these terms, but the discussion is here, and I think, it will, I think it will continue. I think Europeans are also cautious when they start looking at the longer term. How, for, for how long is this relationship, or at least this level, or let's say this honeymoon, how long is, will this be sustainable? Because I mean, the, um, as then maybe colleagues in the U.S. might 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 also uh, talk a little bit about, there will be midterm elections in 2022, 
uh, where the House of Representatives, all seats at the House of Representatives will be up for election and 34 seats at the Senate will be up uh, for election. So will this change, you know, the dynamic? And clearly, I mean, I think domestic politics was already said in this uh, conversation many, many times. And I think President Biden, if, I mean, in his, uh, you know, this week, I think this was always very present in, uh, in also in his visit, you know, this, this uh, American foreign policy for, for the middle class. I think the Europeans also don't yet understand exactly what this means. Is this, you know, America first, but just with a nice language? So what, 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 what really is this? And, and so I think there is also cautious in when we look, um, uh, when, uh, when I think when Europeans are looking, uh, are, are looking forward. Having said this, I also believe that this is, also, this is a window of opportunity. So the time is really short. So I think we have a window of opportunity because, I mean, of course, I mean, if you, if you, if, if you ask uh, most people in Europe, of course, people would, the preference would be that President Biden or someone like him or espousing, you know, at least defending the, the transatlantic relationship, NATO, the EU will still be president. Um, uh, but uh, I think it, this is something that we, we, we really need to, to, to take advantage of the moment that is there now. And here I'd like to make a separation between member states and the, the, the institution, the EU. Because I believe in all of, I mean, there was, the, 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 when you read, read a communique, I mean, there were task forces, working groups, high level groups, dialogues, partnerships. I believe that from, let's say, from the working level, from the technical point of view, I mean, the EU institutions are ready to start this work, to cooperate. But we really need to see where are these working groups, where are all of these initiatives, where are they going to lead us? And I think there that the issues, let's say, um, uh, where we might find more difficulties, I would say that it's more on the political and, and strategic level. And here, I mean, I must agree with some of the things that were already said. I think China is, I mean, it's for, for the US is the central uh, challenge to its uh, national security. And, and so it's seen as, a, let's say, as a threat. And for Europeans, for many Europeans, for many European countries, China is seen as an economic opportunity. So, we, so I, I think, I mean, our American friends also need to understand uh, this, uh, I think, uh, this reality, the same way that we Europeans need to understand what might be the potential strategic challenge that China might pose to us also in, in, in a few years. Because, I mean, this is more, I would say, um, um, uh, on the long term. But really, um, I think there was a little bit of hype on how much China would feature in all of these communiques. And I think people were a little bit, and analysts and observers were a little bit, bit disappointed that China was not probably as, pro as prominent as they would expect. And I think, I mean, in, in the US particularly, because you have almost, uh, I think, bipartisan co uh, consensus on how to, to handle China. So I think, I mean, here, President Biden, I understand for political, but for domestic political reasons, he would have to say, hit all of these notes um, for you know, for his for his uh, for his uh, constituents. Um, finally, I mean, as I anticipated before the summit, I think that the summit with President Putin, I did not expect President Biden. I think he would be clear in trying to set what was already mentioned the red lines, even if some of them might not be exactly clear. And also, I think the risks that there are in setting uh, red lines that then are not or lines in the sand that then you know get overstepped. But I believe that, that um, if for, for the US, if they're really they're starting to focus their attention, if China is really the problem, then, uh, uh, you know, so let's say um, antagonizing, you know, uh, Russia and, 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 and Mr. Putin, uh, you know, if, if this is overdone, I think it might undermine this sort of larger strategic interest and even drive, you know, Mr. Putin further into, uh, into, into, China's, into China's arms. I think there is also, and then here the question that I would have is whether if there is, let's say, in this case, a, an opening to Russia under the, the certain concept. First, is, is this even possible to have an opening to, 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 to Russia to avoid that Russia and China uh, come together, let's say, in a more uh, sort of geostrategic um, uh, you know, sort of arrangement against, I mean, the, the, the US and, and the West. And, uh, so is this first possible? But if this does take place, and given that in Europe, at least so far, there has been, even if there are, you know, these agreements among member states, there's been an ability to maintain some unity vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia, what will this do to that, to, 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 to that process? Because clearly there's also a lot of will from some member states that we need to, I mean, to engage much more, uh, much, uh, much more um, with Russia. And these issues will be discussed this week again, again in Brussels. So this is sort of my overall um, sort of appreciation. Of course, I mean, we didn't mention so many of the other issues, you know, from, from let's say, from digital and 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 you know that. But anyway, so I think there are now. I think it's it's really to to get to work. 
and to make all of these, uh, you know, uh, working groups um, uh, and and on all of these task forces uh, change. And and I think my final point uh, that why then uh, Europeans might still be cautious. It would have been even if I understand that it's difficult. It would have been clearly a sign of turning the page if the tariffs on steel and aluminium that were imposed by Mr. Trump had been dropped. This would actually mean a, you know, a sort of a cut with the past. And because we are not able to do this, I think that this, this, I mean, this just lingers. And I, and I think we need try really to try to solve this by December um, this year. We should, uh, I know Americans and Europeans together should be able to, to, to address this issue. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks to you, Ricardo. Thank you very much. Uh, wonderful uh, vision from from Brussels. And now to to to, to play our promise that to make to make an event short, I will invite the rest of the panelists to return to the to the to the screen, and uh, I will invite all of you to have reactions on the different issues that your colleagues said. But first of all, I wanted to to put a, a question that you didn't tackle yet. Um, so President Biden, the day before the trip to to, to the UK, announced the, that he was uh, purchasing five five hundred million vaccines for for third countries, and also somehow what we read is that the EU was somehow caught by surprise uh, when the President Biden proposed a wave of vaccine uh, patents. So. What do you think about the coordination? Uh, so if it has been enough coordination or a joint approach uh, between the US and the EU when it comes to international vaccination strategy? Or do you think that there are significant di divergences on the respective approaches that prevent that? So what's your intake on that issue? Feel free to just talk. I'm happy to take a first shot. Um, Please. I actually think in terms of what Biden has done is sort of said, yes, we're going to have a potentially a TRIPS waiver in terms of vaccines and, you know, patents, but saying it, they have not yet put forward a proposal. And there have been other proposals from other countries, I believe South Africa and Brazil, that are talking about a waiver of the patents. And, you know, this gets into a lot of financial implications, obviously in the US and EU are in positions where they've actually invested in the vaccine production and put money in the R&D. The Europeans in some respects are right in the sense that just having a waiver and getting that waiver through the WTO or elsewhere is going to take time. Whereas the Europeans are focusing on, let's focus on global supply chains, let's focus on production, let's put that production in the countries that need it. So they're focusing on the immediate delivery, whereas uh, the United States is focusing on more sort of the legal trips, intellectual property issues. So they're coming at it from two very, very different angles. And the other issue too is that the one thing that we tended to forget is that in both countries, we talk about it as the EU rolling out the vaccine, but a lot of the distribution has, you know, and the rollout has been done at the national level. And the same thing in the United States, a lot of the rollout and the vaccination has been done at the state level. And so, you know, those kind of things also, you know, there is different differential vaccine rollouts and take up across states in the United States, which is going to have long term impacts on economic recovery and variants. And in Europe, there's also, you know, the rollout has been slightly different as well. And the different initial choices, you know, Sweden didn't do a lockdown in the same way that other countries did. So to call it the US and EU approach, I think is also very misleading. I said it just account for federalism. So maybe you, Ricardo, have got uh, the, the European, or did at least the Brussels uh, perspective on that issue. And, and I don't. I mean, I don't think there's a Brussels. I mean, the Brussels perspective. I, I think it's it was known. It was declared. I mean, the, the, you know, most Europeans did not agree with uh, you know with a uh, with a patent waiver. And because precisely, you know, the fastest way to get vaccines to people's arms is to, to produce them. And it's to create. I mean, to have the ingredients and have the components that goes into go into this, and that the, the value chains are, are are working. But if you ask me, you know, the effort of the, I mean, the, the, there I think also I mean the G7 could have done much more. 
I mean, they, if you want to donate uh, one billion, I mean, it's very generous to donate one billion vaccines, but you need, you need 11 billion to vaccinate the whole world. So, I mean, this is really uh, clearly not enough. So I think there, what, I, what I would sort of focus, you know, both sides of the Atlantic is really to, to increase capacity, to help pharmaceuticals to actually produce, to increase capacity, and then to distribute vaccines. I mean, we're starting to see already in Europe, some countries, because of the Delta variant, I mean, it, it, people might believe that, you know, that, that this is just sort of a soundbite that until everybody's safe, no one is safe, but this is actually true. I mean, it, it, we are, the numbers showed, of course, I mean, the vaccination, uh, let's say, uh, in the case of Brussels uh, or Belgium is going very well. So you also see that those in the epidemiological situation. But still, there are clearly risks about, you know, these this variants and mutations of the virus and how then vaccines uh, can, can deal with it. I think it's, it's, it's really, I mean, it's, I think it continues to be a race against the time. And sometimes I, I just don't have the sort of the, the feeling that uh, um, everyone or decision makers and politicians understand sort of the, I mean, I think they understand the urgency. Maybe they haven't found out the best way to, to, to address this issue. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Jeff, uh, Federica, have got uh, remarks on that? I had a couple. First, on the on the vaccines, that was, you know, one of the things I somehow referred to. I mean, the reason why the U.S. was ahead in vaccine is because that basically the state threw a lot of money into pharmaceutical companies, not knowing if if the vaccination would work or not, right? And this actually was done by by Trump and uh, and Biden got the got the, the, the dividends out, out of that, while Europe was entrapped, like Ricardo was saying, you know, it was entrapped in bureaucratic measures, which, which made it slower to, slower to happen. At the domestic level, it's in the US is very interesting as well, because, you know, this is, a, this is free healthcare, right? Which is something unheard of. So what are gonna be the consequences in terms of healthcare domestically? It's uh, it's uh, is yet yet to be seen, but it's certainly interesting. Uh, going back to other aspects, I would like to agree on what uh, Ricardo said about Russia, and I think uh, again uh, Biden and his experience is making a difference. And uh, I mentioned before that it was rather controversial at the domestic level that he would meet with Putin, and uh, the fact that he did, and I have to say I was skeptical because you know, of the role that some people play in the Department of State, say, Victoria Nuland, who is clearly anti and always been anti-Russian. And uh, so the fact that he met, the way he met, first of all, signals a clear victory of a White House, Biden and Jake Sullivan over Blinken and, uh, and Toria Nuland. So it was an interesting debate to watch. Secondly, Biden is one of a few Americans who understand the Russian perspective. And this is very, very important because what generally Americans don't understand, even scholars, is that Russia perceives itself as an empire, you know, as, as a power and wants this role to be recognized. And, uh, and, and Biden give, gave it to them, right? So it's, it's interesting because, and, and reassuring because finally you have someone who has such an experience but also a unique perspective because to Biden, his Irish background is very important. So he has some sort of European inside, if you want. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting because we can hopefully go back to more fruitful relations, that is to say, cooperate with Russia wherever we need to. And it's still an adversary, but, uh, but there are things where we have to work with Otherwise, as Ricardo said, we're just pushing Russia more and more into China's hands, which has been clear for the last decades, but nobody seemed to understand or care before. Great. Uh, thank you very much, Federica. Jeff, uh, you wanted to say something about the vaccines? I understood. Uh, nothing about the vaccines per se, although I think the point that you made uh, sort of at the start of your, your, your remarks about consultation in advance of a policy announcement um, you know, I think is interesting in the sense that here you have basic continuity in American foreign policy, which is to, you know, consultation means you inform the other person a few, a few hours beforehand that you're going to make a big policy announcement. Uh, so despite sort of the rhetoric of being much more about multilateralism and so forth, uh, in practical terms, it's sort of business as usual. 
Yeah, that's absolutely true. Okay, we have still, uh, we have already the minister with us, but before uh, passing the floor on her, is any last remark uh, any of you uh, would like to, to do? All right, then it's my pleasure to open the floor to Ms. Victoria Alzina, the Catalan Minister of for, for Foreign Action and Open Government, who is going to address us a few words on the importance for Catalonia of President Biden, uh, Biden visit to Europe. Mr. Alzina has got one big advantage. She's been living and working in the US for a number of years. Therefore, she had a double perspective on the issue. So Mr. Alzina, welcome, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much. To be true, it's a real pleasure to be here with all of you today, because I should say that my life itself has a transatlantic, you know, <laughs> tradition. So uh, now I'm connecting from Barcelona, from the headquarters of the ministry here back home, but I've been living for the last decade in the U.S., uh, splitting my time mainly between Cambridge, Massachusetts and New York as a professor first at Harvard University and after at New York University, where uh, one month ago, I was leading the Center for Urban Science and Progress that is a partnership between NYU and the city of New York. And I just landed in Barcelona. So uh, I, want, I want to say that I'm already missing a little bit the US. So I'm very happy to connect to this event. Isidra, thank you so much for organizing this conversation. Thank you to Megan, uh, to Federica, to Jeffrey and, and Ricardo for, for uh, joining. And I should say that um, this is a topic that is really exciting, particularly in the context where we are, right? I've been following US politics very closely. My field of expertise is political science, and I'm very much involved in the conversation that is happening around uh, the challenges that we are all facing after the pandemic. This is a ministry that focuses on foreign action, but also focuses on open government. So here we are working as part of this, this same, uh, you know, venture. We are working around um, digitalization, data, participation, public-private partnerships to promote a lot of the challenges that, as far as I understand, you have been discussing as part of this, as part of this conversation, right? We have a long tradition here in Catalonia uh, about uh, these transatlantic relationships, right? And I should say that this takes place at two different levels. It takes place at the public arena, because uh, I, I didn't know the year, but I, I I knew that the third consulate that the US opened in, in Europe, it was precisely in Barcelona. The first one uh, was in Belfast and in Naples, right? And the third one was here. And this morning when I was uh, preparing uh, what I wanted to share with you today, I have found the year and it was in uh, 17, uh, 1797. So it was really a long time ago, right? That this tradition started, but it, it, it was in the framework of the businesses around the textile industry that we had nearby Barcelona. So I was, you know, I was even myself surprised knowing that it was the third one, that it was long time ago. As you know, we have a presence, uh, the Catalan government uh, has a presence in the US, Isidra is our current delegate, myself, myself, I was the former delegate precisely of the Catalan government in the in the US and Canada. And indeed, if we want to put a number in, in connected to this relationship is four billion. That's the number uh, four billion dollars in which we, we, we trade annually, right? Between between Catalonia and, and the US. It was in uh, 1989 uh, that the Catalan government opened the first trade uh, office it was in New York. That was the first city in which we had a formal presence as part, of, as part of the government. And after we have been developing and growing relationships, our delegation, as you may know, we have uh, two offices. The headquarters is in Washington, but we have a second office in New York. 
And as part of this, we have been uh, building relationships in, 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 in different places, right? We have uh, been growing memorandums of understanding with Massachusetts, with California. We have a special relationship with New York State and Florida. And we are trying, Isidra indeed is trying to promote and lead this conversation in the different corners of, of, of this country. As you know, Catalonia is, all, is also deeply committed to be part of the European Union. So for us, the transatlantic relationships that we have with the US cannot be understood without considering the special relationship that uh, Catalonia has with, uh, with the European Union, right? And, and in that sense, uh, I think that as part, for example, of the big challenges that the European Union is facing and promoting, as part of the next generation funds, right? The bigger uh, source of money that Europe is going to uh, distribute among the member the, among the members is the biggest after the Marshall Plan. So that's that's a lot of millions that we want to invest in sustainability, in the digitalization, in uh, better connecting our knowledge systems and the university systems. And this is where we are now, right? So we are uh, working with Europe. We are working with these recovery funds that we call the next generation funds that will invest uh, around 70% of those funds in digitalization and sustainability. So this will be two of the big challenges that you have been uh, covering as part of this conversation that will really frame how we want to collaborate, first of all, with the EU and after with the US, right? And this is how we understand the transatlantic relationships in, in the short term. And of course, we, we, we are very much pleased that uh, the Biden administration also has these two dimensions as key dimensions of his mandate, right? And we want to build as many bridges as possible, connecting both sides of the Atlantic and especially considering that we share the same challenges uh, in, in both places. From my own perspective, as someone that is applying for the US citizenship at the same time that it has uh, the roots in Barcelona and someone that it has been working in both sides of the Atlantic and know well how much we can learn one to each other, right? As part of this conversation, I will really promote and, and, and I will try to encourage as many projects and as many growing relationships as possible precisely in those spaces. So I don't want to use more of your time. I want to really thank you, uh, Jeff, Megan, uh, Federica, and, and Ricardo for joining us. Isidra, thank you for organizing this conversation. And this house, this ministry is your house in Barcelona. And I will be very much happy to receive you all here. And I hope, Isidra, I will jump to the US sooner than later to visit you, to work with the delegation, and also, you know, to do some boxes because I still have my apartment in New York and my apartment in Cambridge. So I have an extra reason to cross the Atlantic in this case. Thank you so much. And uh, please feel free to uh, knock our door as many times as you need. And this is your house. Excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Minister Alzina. So we, we got the, the time frame we, we said at the beginning. So unless any of you would like to put on the table on one last remark, I'm going to proceed to close the, the, the today's event. So now it's your turn, now or never. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I yeah, sorry, please. I want to speak after the minister because I mean, just and no one wants, but I think this element is really, really important. I mean, I was also an AFS student, so an exchange student in the US. I was then on a Fulbright, and I think we would today we didn't discuss this, but I think these relationships are fundamental. And what I mean, the minister has done, you know, being in the US, coming back to Europe, I think we need to have much more of this. I mean, and the programs are there, but maybe you also need to invest a lot in, I mean, we, I mean, in the jargon, we call the people to people contacts, but I think they are important. I mean, I still have a family that lives in Chicago in the US. I've been in touch with them for 35 years. They are just part of my family. So this is really, really, I think this is very, very important. So I just wanted to, to you know, congratulate the minister and also all of you, but in a sense that this dimension, I think the personal dimension is very important. If you think about it, you know, you have here on the panel, 
two Europeans from the US, one European who just came back from the US, an American from, <laughs> an American in Barcelona and another, and another in Europe who has been studying in, in, in the US. And yes, I, I agree with you. This is the most important thing. And this is, and again, I think Biden understands this more than anybody else because it's been long in government. This has long been the attractiveness of, of the US on Europe and vice versa. So, yeah. Great, yeah. This panel is not by chance like this for some reason. Great, thank, thank you very much. Uh, wanted to say something, Minister? No, nothing. Okay, okay sorry. Besides, besides the fact that uh, I hope we can continue this, this conversation soon. Thank you so much to all of you for joining. Perfect. Thank you very much, Minister Alzina, for your words. Uh, thank you very much to all our panelists today. Of course, thank you also to our partners today, the delegation of the Catalan government to the European, to the European Union and the Center for Contemporary Studies. And of course, thank you very much to the audience. Uh, stay tuned, we will invite you for future activities. Thanks so much. Thank you for having us. Have a good day. Bye-bye, thanks very much. Bye. Thank you.